Hi, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the People's Health Dispatch. Uh, today, we are looking at uh, what's going on with health in Palestine as Israeli attacks continue uh, for uh, more than two weeks. Uh, we are joined here uh, uh, by, uh, by Leit, uh, who is uh, one of the health activists in the People's Health Movement, war and conflict group, uh, and uh, He's a Palestinian uh, living in Palestine, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we're going to talk today uh, about the situation report, but also about the broader context uh, of health in Palestine. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and maybe, yes, just to uh, jump right in, perhaps we can uh, start with uh, a little bit of a situation update. Uh, on Gaza, because that has been uh, uh, top of the news for the for the last days, and then move on to the to the rest of the occupied territories. Yeah, of course, uh, and, and that is completely the right place to start. The situation in Gaza is unbelievable, and it's it's horrifying. And when we think that things can't get worse or things can't continue because of how horrifying they are, uh, we are shocked by even more brutality. We are talking now about uh, nearly 7,000 Palestinians who have been killed by the bombardment. We're talking about half of the houses in Gaza being damaged or destroyed. We're talking about people being told to flee, 1.1 million people being told to flee, and then being bombed in the places that they have fled to under the instruction of the Israeli army. We're talking about 40% of the casualties being children, when 50% of the population in Gaza are children. This is indiscriminate, but I think it's also very important to uh emphasize that it's not uh that it's not uh random it is very it is very it is very purposeful um the israeli israeli politicians have made their intention to wipe out gaza very clear the dehumanizing language that we've seen calling uh shutting down any discussion about the fact that there might be civilians in Gaza, talking about um, you know human animals, uh, all of these all of these dehumanization tactics are were preludes to a genocide. And so, what we are seeing today is an attempted genocide on the Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip. So it is it is truly horrifying to to see this, and it's truly horrifying to for the world to be collectively gaslighting the Palestinian population as it describes this and talking about nuances and talking about uh, you know, the need to, to understand uh, the various perspectives um, at play here. We are talking about an Israeli, uh, an Israeli regime that has always been intent on wiping out uh, the Palestinian population, has always has acted, you know, has acted over the decades to do that. And um, we're still stuck in uh, the need to prove our humanity. To focus more on the health situation, which, which um, I know listeners uh, will be particularly interested in, uh, we're, we're talking about hospitals in Gaza reporting that they are getting through a month's worth of consumables in a day. We're talking about a demand that is 30 times higher, but working with what the uh, Ministry of Health in Gaza described as a third of the usual health personnel. We're talking about the supply of consumables being completely cut off because even before the 7th of October, Israel severely limited uh, access of goods and people in and out of Gaza through a blockade that had been going on since 2007. Since, uh, you know, for the last two weeks, Israel has 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 imposed a total blockade. That means nothing and no one getting in or out. That includes water. That includes fuel. That includes electricity. That includes food. That includes medical supplies and medications. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking about doctors treating wound infections 
with vinegar. That, that is something that's happening. We're talking about um, explosives being used and fires being set to houses and doctors not having uh, not, not having burns dressings to, to use. We're talking about people being treated on the floor and their relatives holding up the fluid bags for them. We're talking about 12 hospitals, one third of the hospitals in Gaza, already being out because of either damage or because they've run out of fuel. And even the UN Relief and Works Agency is expecting to run out of fuel today. And they are talking about already having made choices about whether they share the fuel, the little fuel that they have with hospitals, shelters, or bakeries. That is the situation on the ground at the moment. And every time I ask any of my colleagues in Gaza, or every time I communicate with them, they just they say things like, it is hell. They say they they say things like we are we are living in hell. They 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 talk about things getting worse and worse. When I see them, if they're being interviewed on the TV, you know, you see the exhaustion, you see the disbelief, you see just the the sheer uh, being in the middle of this and it not stopping day after day. Absolutely, and I mean, there, there's no. <laughs> There's no right or wrong thing to say after, you know, what you, what you just shared. It's the situation in Gaza that we've been observing for the past past weeks is something truly horrifying. And I think that, you know, uh, while most governments in the world have sided with, with Israel very clearly, we have seen also people around uh, standing in solidarity with Palestine. Um, and I think that's... That's something I hope that's an attempt that's going to last and that's actually going to find more practical ways of supporting the, the struggle of the people in Palestine. But before we move on and maybe talk a bit more about that broader political analysis, um, I was wondering if we can spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what's going on in the West Bank, both in health and otherwise, because that's something that we've, we've heard significantly less of. But we do know that it's uh, also uh, also very worrying what uh, uh, what you're seeing happening there. Yeah, thank you for asking that because n not only is it being ignored, I think the other thing to bear in mind what happened, what Israel subjects Palestinians to uh, in the rest of Palestine and outside of Palestine, uh, also helps us understand uh, what, what Israel is doing. In the Gaza Strip, it is all it is all part of uh, the same package of settler colonialism, of this policy and intention to eliminate the Palestinian population. Uh, you know, the killing, the dispossession happens. It happens to Palestinians uh, regardless where they are, uh, through different through different means at different paces, using different methods. So, uh, just to maybe take a few. Um, a few kind of uh, specific um, bits of information about what's going on in the in the West Bank. Um, I think that it's important to first of all talk about the total control uh, that Israel exerts in the um, in the West Bank. And so, on a normal day, Israel is able to erect you know checkpoints, roadblocks, uh, whatever, anywhere that it really wants. Um, at a moment's notice. Uh, what it has done since the 7th of October is make it incredibly difficult for Palestinians to move beyond their kind of immediate localities. So that means that, you know, um, the flow of people and goods and of course even patients has been restricted by the imposition of strict checkpoints, many of which are completely closed and some of which will subject people to delays and long searches, which means that um, even if there are there is a way, for example, to get from the city of Nablus to the city of Ramallah, which is on a normal day, a 54 kilometer journey, there's a long kind of detour to take um, in order to uh, get to the checkpoint that's open, uh, where people would face delays and where people will also be uh, going between Israeli settlements uh where even if the settlers aren't soldiers on duty uh they are heavily armed they are extremely violent and they are being 
egged on to be even more violent by the Israeli state. So the Israeli state is delivering 10,000 rifles, 10,000 rifles to Israeli settlers in the West Bank. And it's doing so so ceremoniously. You see the videos of them distributing them. And they're just, you know, handing over these huge guns to fanatic settlers who who live right on our doorsteps and who are kind of participating in that total domination. And so uh, so that's kind of one of the, the one of the most noticeable things that you see is that lack of movement um, from uh, because of the actions of the Israeli army that's shutting uh, the, the the routes and the checkpoints between uh, localities and the Israeli settlers who are subjecting anyone who passes through to violence. That has extended to, for example, if we just take one example, uh, the village of Husra, uh, you know, has two settlements that sit on top of its lands, and um, the settlers from from those outposts were for a week before the seventh of October, shutting off the entrance and exit to Qusra village. They were attacking residents and burn, trying to burn houses and cars and, and whatever. And um, then a few days, I can't remember which day it was exactly after the 7th of October, they descended again on the village of Qusra and opened fire alongside the Israeli army, which came and usually kind of says that their presence is there to protect uh, you know, the Palestinian civilian population in case of any attacks on them, actually participated in the shooting the Israeli settlers ended up killing three people that day, and the Israeli army killed one. So four people were killed by Israelis, with settlers and soldiers working hand in hand. The next day, at the funeral of the people uh, who were killed by the Israeli army, the Israeli army and settlers came back and killed two more Palestinians, a father and his son. That's the type of violence that we're seeing, and it's it's there to to kill, but it's there also to intimidate and and subjugate and keep people within those localities and squeeze the Palestinian population further, which of course also gives the Israeli army and settlers uh, a green card to to uh, just take over more lands and. Uh, you know, we're, we're now entering the the olive harvest season. People aren't able to access their lands, and that makes them vulnerable to take over by settlers and, and soldiers, which are stated goals of the settler movement and of the Israeli state. So we're talking about this possession taking place in the West Bank as well as we speak, which is a continuation of something that's been going on since uh, 1967. Um, we're seeing uh, also, obviously, um, with, with settlers and soldiers being even more violent than they are normally, a, a rapidly increasing um, rate of he- attacks on healthcare. So ambulances being obstructed. We're seeing, um, you know, uh, military searches of um, uh, of, of healthcare assets. Um, where, where you know we're seeing people being injured and, and ambulances not being able to reach them, which also comes alongside uh, a massively increasing rate of Israeli raids on Palestinian towns to imprison and kill Palestinians. We've seen airstrikes in the in the West Bank for the first time in a long time. Uh, you know there was a horrific one in, in Janine refugee camp just a few days ago at a mosque, um, and 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 we're seeing uh, martyrs and and people and, and injured and people being imprisoned in, in the West Bank every single day. We've seen the number of political prisoners almost double in two weeks. There were 5,200 uh, Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails on the 6th of October. We now don't know the number. We don't know the number of people who are imprisoned. It's estimated to be 10,000. And that's because the uh, Israeli military is severely restricting lawyer visits to Palestinian prisoners and has completely withdrawn all family and Red Cross visits to Israeli prisons and has withdrawn every one of the rights that uh, prisoners have have hard won uh, through protests and hunger strikes over the years. So, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, televisions being confiscated, radios being confiscated, all electrical outlets being uh, shut off, water access to water being restricted, canteens being closed. So only the food that's being supplied by the Israeli prison service, which is completely inadequate in both in quantity and quality, being the only food that's available for prisoners. We're talking about all um, belongings being confiscated. So the only thing that a prisoner has is their clothes that they're currently wearing. And some prisoners don't even have mattresses because Israel has suspended 
the rule about limiting the number of prisoners in a particular cell. Um, and so th the prisons are now being overcrowded. They're opening new prisons, and we don't even know which ones they are. So we're, we're talking about a complete crackdown. And that um, has, has led, and, and we believe it's led directly, these conditions and, and the lack of oversight of what's going on in the prisons led to the death of two prisoners in Israeli prisons this week. Um, one was being held in administrative detention, and one was not even charged with anything yet. He'd been in prison for two days, not even uh, brought to charges or to administrative detention. So the 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 expectation is that he was likely tortured to death. Well, that's uh, yeah. Again, it's uh, it's very disturbing to hear the extent to which uh, the occupation is kind of cracking down of, on people of uh, you know who who are just trying to live their lives in in their own land so uh, i mean it's uh, again i'm sorry if i'm not making much sense but of course it's very difficult to uh, talk about something that uh, i think we uh, we all agree is very and just wrong uh, and it, it um, it's kind of hard to contextualize it in this way and make a sense of of a conversation that is just showing uh, what uh, you've been living through for the past, you know, decades and uh, almost a century now. If we look at it in in the whole uh, in the whole scale, so it's truly amazing. And I think that um, to come back to what we mentioned before, you know, it, it has been also truly. Uh, truly dis disturbing and amazing at the same time to see how the West has reacted to that and how corporate media is still reacting to it uh, and essentially just gaslighting everybody about what's going on in Palestine and the uh, the extent of uh, of the horrific horrific uh, life conditions that people um, people are forced to live in um, at the same time you know in Speaking from a Western point of view, we've seen uh, a major crackdown on uh, on yeah. uh, protests uh, in support of Palestine, which again is showing something about the government that we have in place here. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the bans actually did not make the people back out uh, back away, and I think that's that's a good sign. We have seen massive massive rallies uh, in major cities uh, across the U.S. across Europe. Um, and of course, these rallies uh, mostly focus to support what uh, they're hearing from the Palestinian people and uh, want to support the demands of the Palestinian people. So maybe to close off, uh, maybe we can just, um, you know, walk through, in addition to ceasefire, of course, which we have seen uh, top of the agenda for, for the last couple of days, people calling for, a cease, for immediate ceasefire now. But I think there are also... Uh, other things that uh, are worth highlighting and uh, pushing for by both uh, both uh, movements in Palestine and across the world. So maybe just a brief overview of that. Yeah, of course. So yeah, as you say, the it is of course important to um, to to address kind of what is happening now, uh, but but it's also um, incredibly important to put this in context because. If we only have a ceasefire, as an example, then we're not saying, you know, we're not talking about, we're not addressing the siege, not just the siege that's going on since the uh, since uh, a couple of weeks, which is uh, cutting off completely water and electricity and fuel, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the siege that's been imposed on Gaza by Israel since 2007, we're talking about, um, you know, Israel exerting that control what we should be looking at is one how to stop the immediate damage that's that's happening. So of course we absolutely need a ceasefire. Two weeks ago, we need it two weeks ago. But 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 basically, as soon as it, as it is possible to, to to impose a ceasefire, we need uh, an end to the siege. But we also need to completely reverse um, the control that Israel even has over a Palestinian population. So it, it is that. So so, and that requires, uh, a, you know, 
looking at that broader picture, that Israel doesn't have the power to control whether Palestinian enters their land or doesn't enter their land, whether they live a healthy and fulfilling life or not. And, and that's where that, that demand for Palestinian self-determination comes in. And that self-determination absolutely cannot happen with Israel being as powerful as it is over the lives of Palestinians. And so, of course, that would include then, so then within that framework, then we include um the you know the end of the end of the siege and uh the end of the occupation uh of of the west bank the end of the occupy of, of the occupation of the lands that were stolen in 1948 that dispossession that started as long ago as that which would allow palestinian refugees to return uh to 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 the homes and lands and um and country that they were kicked out of um 75 years ago uh you know a population that that has its rights only on paper uh, from from uh, UN resolutions and, and so on, but which has not been realized, and that no one is working uh, on a con- you know, on concerted effort to to ensure that that those rights are fulfilled, um, and that requires so so all of those things would require a complete shift um, in the power, which means that the uh, resistance to Israel needs to look at how Israel draws its power. And we're talking about here cultural, political, and economic power um, that Israel is able to leverage internationally. And so it's the responsibility of every single person to look at their doorstep and think, you know, is the job that I'm in serving these colonial interests? Is the is are the products that I buy, um, you know, are the institutional links that, that, that we have? So looking at academic institutions, uh, you know, we know that there's academic um, uh, whitewashing of, of Israeli crimes. We know that there's environmental greenwashing. We know that there's queer pinkwashing. Um, and we need to resist those efforts because they are central to how Israel kind of propagates its power um, by, you know, um, putting forward, for example, like innocuous academic and health partnerships, but then Actually, when you look at a lot of academic and health institutions and even the projects themselves, then go on quite often to serve uh, Israeli military purposes. We see it really clearly as well in the agricultural industry. So when we look at, you know, Israel, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's things that's kind of almost miraculous coming out of the Bible. Like we, we, we get water from thin air. But those things are often actually a product of military um, military um, uh, uh, research that then is... Uh, used in agriculture or the other way around. It's a revolving door. And so when we talk, I mean, Israel keeps, love, loves talking about dual use uh, equipment that goes onto the Gaza Strip. They're the best at the dual use uh, story, right? The, the dual use of basically everything in their society, even people, right? The hundreds of thousands being uh, drafted to uh, invade Gaza in the next few days, their entire population is dual use civilians when they feel like they want to be civilians, and then, um, you know, h- hard combatants when they want them to be. So so that's the fate that, you know, those are the two faces of the, the, um, of, of Israeli colonialism, but, but they're there to create uh, that image for Israel, um, which is kind of quite innocuous, but actually has this other face behind it, which which serves um, the, its colonial interests. So it's really important to be, to, 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 to recognize uh, that, that Israel does um, kind of leverage that power from cultural institutions, from academic institutions, from health institutions all around the world. And it's important to boycott all of that until uh, Palestinians are free. And that means full self-determination. And the final thing I would just say as well is um, reparations for all the damage, all the destroyed houses, all the people who have been killed, all the pain, all the suffering that's been caused, that doesn't go away, even if Israel likes to pretend like it's over as soon as it achieves its military goals. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, and uh, I do believe that we'll see each other again here sometime soon. Uh, yeah. And yes, uh, thank you again so much for joining us and for making time to do this. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.